We turn now to the letter from Paul to the Galatians. And we read these words in the fifth chapter. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, for you were called to freedom. Brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Pray with me. Lord, send your spirit upon us, so that we may hear your word, in our Savior's name, amen. So if you go to the Washington, D.C., and you go into the Capitol building, in the rotunda, there are a number of paintings, and one of them is this painting by John Trumbull of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and if you look at it, there's a table, there's nothing but a couple of quill pens and paper on the table as they prepare to sign the Declaration. There are 42 of the 56 signers of the Declaration in this, in this picture. 16 of them are Presbyterian, by the way. Um, <laughs> if you look closely, it appears that Thomas Jefferson is standing on the foot of John Adams. <laughs> perhaps signaling a little of their rivalry. Perhaps it's just an accident of paint. Who knows? Anyway, if you walk down the mall, in Washington, D.C., a little bit to the National Gallery of Art, we come on another painting of another table. This one's by Salvador Dali. Mm -hmm. Men gathering around a table where there's nothing more than bread and a couple of glasses of wine. All 12 disciples are there, including, interestingly enough, including Judas. If you look not so carefully, you don't have to really be too observant to notice above the scene of course, the chest and the arms of the Savior in the pose of the crucifix. Now, it's not well known that the actual signing of the Declaration of Independence was not July 4th, it was August 2nd, 1776. The 4th of July was the date of the adoption by the Continental Congress, but it took slightly less than a month for all the various state assemblies and committees to approve it and for the document to be and engrossed, which means written painstakingly in a large print so that it could be seen in a public, uh, in a public event. Now the date of the Last Supper, of course, is unknown, except for the fact that it was the night before the crucifixion of Jesus. The men signing the Declaration of Independence were building something new a new nation, with a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. These men were called to freedom from, from the tyrannical government of Britain, from taxation without representation, from government from a distance, government by a king. And they wrote words that many of us had to memorize when we were in school. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among those rights are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. It wasn't just personal freedom that the Declaration of Independence called for. At the close of the Declaration, the very last line are words that I never had to memorize. But it says this, for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So this freedom that is our heritage in this nation comes with something of a calling, something of a responsibility as well. Our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. Those who were gathered around that table in Jerusalem were also building something. They were the beginning of a new humanity, 
made possible by Jesus and whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. These men too were called to freedom, and so are all of us who have followed them. Freedom from a past which binds us, freedom from guilt, freedom from the powers of sin and evil and even of death. But it's not just a freedom from something. Paul writes a rather odd phrase. Did you catch it, the very first phrase? For freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. We're set free for a purpose. Not just the freedom to make our own decisions, to do what we will, certainly not the freedom for self-indulgence, which Paul warns us against, but a freedom that binds our welfare to the welfare of others. A freedom that finds its fulfillment in actually making a commitment to love our neighbor as ourselves. If you really get the gift of God in Christ, if you really get it, then you can't look at anyone else in the same way ever again. A couple of chapters earlier in the same letter, Paul writes that in Christ there is no slave nor free, there is no Jew nor Greek, there is no male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus. That's the view of humanity, really, that God isn't so much building, because God has already done it. God is asking us to see it to see beyond race and gender and language and nationality, to see beyond all that would divide us, beyond all that would divide us, and to see that God's calling is that all would be one in Christ. We gather around a table today. This table looks nothing like the table in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago but it is the Lord's table. And those who come to this table and partake of the bread and the cup may partake of the freedom that Christ offers. A freedom that comes to us without cost, but a freedom that asks of us, that asks of us simply that we welcome all to the same table. That we welcome everyone to this table. Everyone. Let us keep the feast. Pray with me. Oh Lord, it was your prayer on the last night of your life that all of you want. Help us in our own ways our own moments, in our own communities, in our own associations, in our own lives, to live into that truth. For Christ's sake, for the world's sake, and for our own sakes.